Um, what I want to do is um, refer to the, the early work I'm doing in my future fellowship, ARC Future Fellowship, which is looking at um, learning through practice and how we might develop a curriculum and pedagogy of practice. And I'd like to do the following headings, address the following headings. Learning through practice, look at the traditions and traditions and practices behind that, conceptualising learning through practice, and then consideration of practice curriculum, practice pedagogies, and epistemologies of practice, and then summarise. Um, I won't be able to cover the topic in the kind of depth I would have liked, so I'm going to take an instance of each when I refer to curriculum, pedagogy, and epistemologies of practice. Okay. So some premises first is that um, from, you know, from where I sit, there's no separation amongst doing, learning, and also remaking the practice. Those three things come together as humans engage in those, uh, those activities. What people do, what they learn, and how things are remade are obviously subject, though, to the outcomes of those processes and occur in different ways. Um, I think we need to develop an account of learning through practice which elaborates this in greater detail, which is, I guess, what my gig is all about. And but I think, importantly, this goes beyond, needs to go beyond the discourse of schooling and schooling societies. We all live within school societies, and we've got terribly used to the discourse of schooling, which, for instance, you know, there's almost a synonym between um, teaching and learning, for instance. And I think we need to distance ourselves that for the reasons I'll, I'll elaborate. And uh, part of the reason is I think there's clear limits of what is proposed and enacted through educational provisions and its privileging. So th this is not, a, but this is not an anti-schooling uh, discourse, an anti-schooling argument. What, it, what it's about is trying to make space and legitimise um, learning through practice. So learning through practice is probably the most common and um, long-standing process of learning occupations across human history. It's 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 how human humanity has progressed and. It's central to hu humanity. I mean, we, we essentially we wouldn't be here today if people had not learned through practice, uh, developed those, those practices, those occupational practice, and continue to refine and develop them further as circumstances, technologies, etc., change. But also, the vast majority of innovations across human history have also come from practice, not from innovation labs and technology parks, but have arisen through practice. Um, similar processes appear to have occurred in Europe, Asia, and likely elsewhere, and that up until the Industrial Revolution, for instance, in Europe and other similar places, that the family or the community was the site in which that, the organization of that learning occurred, whether we're talking about Europe, India, and Japan, China, and I guess I'll add others to the list as I go through that. In Europe, and this mode of occupational preparation was destroyed, I guess, by industrialization. And um, I think looking across human history, it seems that the vast majority of that learning from what I've discerned so far arose through observation and imitation and then practice. This important process called mimesis, which I want to refer to later. So we're talking not about taught processes but processes of learning. Let's go back. Ancient Mesopotamia. The Talmud um, suggested that it is your duty to teach your son the law, to teach, to teach him the law, teach him a trade. The tradition was for the son to go to the rabbi's school in the morning and in the afternoon to learn his father's trade. Plato, talking about what was occurring with the learning of trade in Hellenic Greece, said, the son learned his trade by growing up in his father's family and participating in the family activities, imitating what he saw his father doing. At first, the imitation would be playful and childish, carried out with such toys as a child could handle. Later, it became more deliberately purposive. Pra practice produced technical proficiency, and the growing boy would first act as his father's helper, then his, as, as his associate, and eventually himself would become the head of family and center from which further training in the family craft would radiate. Similarly, in ancient China, evidence has been found by archaeologists of small pieces of pottery, which in some sense are small versions and crude versions of the larger items. And the idea here is that children learn to make these um, items before going on to learn to make the, the, the larger items. 
The point here is that what we can see is the beginnings of a curriculum and pedagogy of practice. Why did the boy go to the rabbi's school in the morning and then engage with the father in the afternoon, not the other way around? That we see the practices as Plato is describing here about the engagement in these activities, childlike activities which had pedagogic potential, and then pedagogic potential of children making small um, item, pottery items out of mud. We also see that um, an early account of the importance of personal epistemologies in, in occupations. This is from Plato again. The best physicians are those who have treated the greatest number of constitutions, good and bad. From youth up, they have combined with the knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. It is better for them not to have been robust health themselves, <laughs> but to have had all manner of diseases in their own persons. For it is not with the body, but with the mind, that they cure the body. And thus they infer further bodily diseases of others from the knowledge of what has taken place in their own body. So there is a strong statement about the importance of personal epistemologies and how a person comes to know and understand the occupational practices in which they're engaged. Yet, there seems to be a range of different societal and situational factors and cultural factors which shape um, how work's undertaken, how it's learned, and how it's valued. So let's take an example. Imperial China, um, so China is the greatest continuing culture that has lasted um, uh, you know, five. 5,000 um, years, and the character of its skilled work and its origins seem in some ways distinct from European traditions. Let's take um, a point that most Anglo-Saxons would understand. The Doomsday Book, which in Britain was, uh, was, was written in Britain in 1086, which essentially was a stock take of what the, the Normans had got from invading Britain, decided that there was probably between one and three quarters and two million people living in Britain at that time. In China, the population was equivalent was 100 million people living in cities of um, large populations over 70,000 that had running water, sewerage, street lighting, etc. A complex and a mass society at that time. To give you an indication of that, in 1085, this is almost the same time that the Doomsday Book was um, published in Britain, the Song, the Song government's mint was producing 10 billion coins a year. 10, sorry, 6 billion coins a year, sorry, 6 billion coins a year. Now just imagine the productive capacity that would have required, the supply chain, the organisation of things. And that was the type of coin they were producing, and that was one of the three methods by which the coins were made. And just to compare what was going on in other cultures at that time in terms of that mass production, by 1114 they were produced, because they, they couldn't keep up with the demand of making the coins and transporting them. So by 1114, they were printing money. You know, forget Gutenberg and forget you know, Caxton. These folks were printing money then. And the requirements for mass production, therefore, arose far earlier in, in China than in, in Europe. <coughs> and for instance, in China, a modular approach was developed for the production of things, of making of houses, even the language. If you go back to basic works in, in China, like fire, rice, you'll see they're very simple characters, and other things are added to them as the language developed. So a, a modular structure of, um, of, of organization of work and tasks developed, and language developed quite early. But even before then, way back in the Shang dynasty, they produced these large um, bronze artifacts in the Zhu dynasty, this is a, a moulds here for, for mass-producing knives. In the Qin dynasty, amongst other things, they produce these um, crossbow triggers, which actually have three moving component parts and can be adopted to different types of crossbows. They also mass-produce coins, drainage pipe, arrowheads, tiles, etc. And in the Tang dynasty, which was famous for its, uh, its, the quality of its artefacts, um, this is the famous stuff from the, the Tangents. We see these high levels of skill. These things have multiple layers of glazes and multiple layers of, um, uh, of processes associated with them. The point is that between the Shang and the Quinn was a movement from craft production to industrial production, which occurred in Europe a lot, lot later. Forget Henry Ford, this happened far earlier here. For instance, um, in the 
This was a town in, 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 in China which was famous for its production of, um, of pottery and led to this style of pottery which was later aped by um, those in, in Holland, the, the, the Delft um, style. And you can never give an indication of the, of, of, of the, um, of the scope of the production um, that in 1577, 96,500 um, small pieces and 56,000 large ones, as well as 21,000 mm -hmm. items for sacrificial ceremonies were produced. And a French missionary um, in 18th century reported what, watching a cup that was being made passing through more than a dozen hands, one worker giving it initial shaping on a wheel in a matter of seconds, another shaping its base, another pressing it into a mold to make its size uniform, another polishing it with a chisel, and so on and so forth. So as many as 70 people could be involved in the um, making the small item. Similarly, that in the um, later, it, there was a, 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 an account of the division of labor in this industry, and it goes as follows. If the painted decoration on each peach, piece is not exactly alike, the set will be spoiled. For this reason, the man who sketches the line will, will learn sketching, but not painting. Those who learn painting will study only painting, etc., etc. Here, this was about the specialization of skills. And I'm going to go through that very quickly, but skills in call calligraphy, for instance, were also practiced by the elite and in ways which I don't think would be practiced in ancient Greece. I could make a comparison, but I don't have the time. This is um, a, 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 a statement about However, the importance <coughs> of these skills and the importance of knowing them. And it's about a man who was a wheelwright, and he was comparing his sense of knowing with that of reading books. I see things in terms of my own work. When I chisel at a wheel, if I go slow, the chisel slides and does not stay put. If I hurry, it jams and doesn't move properly. When it is neither too slow nor too fast, I can feel it in my hand and respond, respond to it in my heart. My mouth cannot describe it in words, but there is something there that I cannot teach my son, and my ca son cannot learn it from me. So I've gone on for 70 years growing old, chiseling wheels. The men of old have died in possession of what they could not transmit. So it follows what you are reading are their dregs. The point there is, what it's saying is, this knowledge that of, of practice is very difficult to articulate, and it is not well captured in text. Um, and I guess this is, refers to the embodiment of learning and the centrality of learning. The point here is that perhaps the, the way that skills were seen here was associated with craft rather than being embedded in occupation in European traditions. And I'll move through this quickly, but the simple point I want to make is not to see this kind of work as mere, being mere production work, which it's very easy for us to do, but probably think more likely the kinds of skill which you now use in aircraft manufacturing, for instance, which require a high level of skills by a number of separate workers. So, um, but little is known about these processes <coughs> of skill development, essentially because the people who could write across different cultures didn't write this stuff because that wasn't important to them. I guess what we know is that perhaps most of this learning occurred through this process of mimesis, of observation and, uh, and um, imitation, and then practice, and occasionally direct guidance by an expert. <coughs> and I think it's important we see these processes in terms of the, the learning potential, but also see them in terms of how they might be applied to contemporary work practices. And it's also important we see these processes not in terms of how uh, we view educational processes, because that constrains our view of them. As um, Bridget Jordan and in, in talking about midwives and their learning in Mexico, stated in 18, um, 90, 1998, the verbal material of ballads and tribal histories was not taught didactically. As nursery rhymes today, such law was acquired and perpetuated through pattern imitation in situations in which the tellings naturally occurred. Whatever the origins of the dialectic, di didactic mode, it was, it's always been a minor mode of knowledge acquisition in our evolutionary history. In the West, however, the didactic mode of teaching and learning has come to prevail in our schools to such an extent that it is often taken for granted as the most natural and the most efficacious and efficient way of going about teaching and learning. This view is held despite the many instances in our own culture of learning through observation and imitation. I think one of the issues that we're facing is that much of what we do is shaped by what I refer to as the 
discourse of school societies and that there's a, a privileged status of schooling. And while schooling, I think, and I use that term broadly, has brought many benefits, it also offers a fairly narrow account about, for instance, the, the, the human knowing. And it tends to be that knowledge which can be observed and measured, as we discussed earlier today, that it's the kinds of learning which um, is valued is the learning which can be declared. And it's largely conceptual knowledge, um, that the knowledge that you can state and conceptual knowledge which is often valued. And it tends to emphasize didactic teaching, didactic teaching, and de-emphasizes the process of learning far more broadly. And I guess this is being rehearsed currently in these prescriptive accounts of what constitutes um, student learning, which might come from something like textbook. And perhaps not captured in all of this is a lot of the procedural learning, the uh, procedural practice people engage with, and also the important embodied learning. So when the midwife is listening to a fetus in vitro for the Doppler scope, and she hears that, she's diagnosing the health of the baby as the fetus's heart, and in a way which is not about a written text. It's about her sense of knowing and her, her, her diagnosis of that sound. I mean, how do we capture that in a, di in, in, in a, in a declarative form? And yet that's so important to the craft of them. That's sort of the skills of the <coughs> um, The haptic qualities of feel that's used by um, physiotherapists and others, and people like myself when I used to work in the clothing industry, of feeling cloth and my shears going through the, um, through the cloth, for instance, um, that's so important to practice. And um, how can we capture that? These don't sit well, I suspect, in the kind of measures that are likely to descend upon us from Texas. And the kind of important dispositions which sit within all of this. And yet, these capacities are central to much of our educational reforms. <coughs> My concern here is that the dominant you know, educational frameworks and discourses ignore this stuff here. The elements of an account of learning through practice, which I'll go through very quickly, I think, have, from what I'm looking at the moment, have three Base, uh, th three, three dimensions. Firstly, curriculum practice, and I see curriculum essentially being the kind of experiences that are, are provided and their ordering. And I go back there to the original, my understanding of the original term, um, curriculum. Pedagogic practice, which I see as the means by which those experiences are enriched or enhanced. And the epistemological practice is the means by which individuals um, construe and construct knowledge through their practice. Now, what's come through, this is some of the stuff that I've been looking at. And, and I'm just going to take one example here. Uh, work by Bunn, um, who looked at how nomadic um, people in Kyrgyzstan learn their skills. And what Bunn um, identified was there's a whole pile of stuff that they learned simply by being part of that tribe. That was hunting, riding horses, how to skin animals, how to make products from those animals. But there was also stuff which was deliberately had to be required. And there was four occupations that Bunn identified that required a specific occupation. The first one was the making of the tents, the kurts, which the yurts, sorry, the yurts, which the people live in. This was a specific set of skills which had to be have a structured preparation. The second one was being a blacksmith, which required a particular set of experiences to learn, which was outside of normal life. The third one was the raising of um, um, sorry, training of eagles to, uh, um, to, to catch a game and bring the game back. And that required the eagle, eagle trainer to grow up with the chick, to actually be raised with the chick and get another chick. And the fourth one was the, the stories, that, the traditional stories that they, they tell, which require to be learned, and the dramatic forms with them also require to be learned in, in different ways. Now, an example, I guess, of how we might think about structuring experiences beyond those that come through simply engaging practices is a project I was doing in, in midwife with colleagues from, um, um, from Flinders. And there, the midwife students engage in two kinds of practice experience, follow-throughs, which is following through birth and women, it's largely through observation and engaging with them to understand the birthing process from their perspective, and clinical placements. And quite simply, what this figure shows is that a, 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 the sequencing, the ordering of those experiences and how that might best assist these midwives to um, learn their skills. That is, the follow-throughs provide the goal states and the understanding of the needs and requirements of the, of, of the birthing women, and then engagement in clinical, increasing engagement in clinical placement, which 
which develop the kind of, of capacities required to engage in the examinations and processes associated with bringing about effective birth. In terms of pedagogic practices, these are some of the stuff that, um, <coughs> that are coming through, which uh, sorry, which which I've been reading about, which I think are an interesting list. And I'm just going to refer to one of them, which some of you might have heard me talk about before, and that is the importance of pedagogy-rich activities. Um, so, for instance, I think a good pedagogy-rich activity is the nurses' handovers. For those who are not familiar, the incoming shift of nurses briefs the so yeah the incoming no the incoming the shift of nurses yeah. is briefed by the outgoing shift of nurses. Sorry, and the ones I've observed, they talk about five things. Firstly, the patient. You know, that they're 84 or whatever, that there's nobody at home to look after them. And the condition or conditions of the patient, the treatment or treatments they're having, the, how they're responding to those treatments, and then the prognosis, the predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Now together, that's a very rich set of, 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 of engagements, and particularly from the predictions of the future, but also aligning Lining causal relations between treatments and responses and then trying to predict the future. A powerful, um, I think, a potentially powerful learning experience which occurs within practice. And I'm sure you can think of others such as getting together with junior staff and preparing a semester's work or other kinds of things. Now, um, I'll go back to my step up. Um, and in terms of personal epistemologies, the importance of personal epistemologies, that is, how people learn because this learning, this is about a learning process and um, it's, it's, this is individual's basis of knowing, yes I'm, I'm conscious of the time, um, <laughs> and the, um, the sense of, of self of the, the learner, their gaze, how they make something, their agency and intentionality and the kind of epistemological acts which um, a learner is engaging and not the least being their introspection, how they make and sense of those experiences. And the one that I'd like to talk about, but I clearly haven't got time, it's disappointing, is the importance of, of nemesis. And these are just some, some of the processes which I've, I've identified in the literature. A very different literature than I would normally read, by the way. And the importance of imitation, a wonderful quote there from Jordan, but I haven't got time for that, is that the point is that nemesis um, is often maligned within the educational discourse. It's seen about just being mimic mimicking. But there are clearly higher forms of, of an imitation, and it's probably a fundamental process, not, it's not only human cognition, but to all, all um, creatures on this planet that can actually move. Um, and much of that um, process is maybe unconscious. And the importance of observation for understanding goal states and being generative of, of, of Kinds of representations and how we um, we deploy information. This here is a schema that says that we need to think about learning pra uh, le practice and learning through practice in terms of culture within a, cu a, a scheme which considers cultural, societal, and situational factors. And then there's this issues of, of curriculum practices and pedagogic practices <coughs> and personal trajectories and the importance of personal epistemologies and all of that. So in sum, I think there's a need, a, a need for an informed account about learning through practice. It requires going beyond the discourse of school societies. And, um, and I think it, the, the premises require drawing upon a range of explanatory bases, which certainly go beyond education and literature. And I think it's dimensions of pedagogy, <coughs> curriculum, and personal epistemology in all of this. And it means accounting for the kind of social, cultural, social, and situational context in which the practice occurs. Thank you very much. Thank you.